favorite thing to eat as a kid, and still my favorite dessert of all time, was custard and jelly, what Americans would call jello. One Saturday, my mom was planning for a big family celebration, and she made a huge bowl of custard and jelly and put it in the fridge. It had every flavor, red, green, and yellow. I couldn't resist it. That whole day, every time I walked past the fridge, I popped my head in with a spoon and sneak a bite. This was a giant bowl meant to last for a week for the whole family. I finished it in one day by myself. I went to bed and I got absolutely butchered by mosquitoes. Mosquitoes loved to feast on me. When I was a kid, it was bad. They would destroy me at night. I would wake up covered with bites and feel ill to my stomach and itchy all over, which was exactly what happened this particular Sunday morning. Covered with mosquito bites, my stomach bloated with custard and jelly. I could barely get out of bed. I felt like I was going to vomit. Then my mom walked in. Get dressed, she said. We're going to church. I don't feel well. That's why we're going to church. That's where Jesus is going to heal you. Eh, I'm not sure that's how it works. Why don't I take medicine, I said, and then pray to Jesus to thank him for giving us the doctors who invented medicine, because medicine is what makes you feel better. You don't need medicine if you have Jesus. Jesus will heal you. Pray to Jesus. But is medicine not a blessing from Jesus? And if Jesus gives us medicine, and we do not take the medicine, are we not denying the grace that he has given us? Like all of our debates about Jesus, this conversation went nowhere. No, get dressed. We're going to church. Chapter 17. My Mother's Life Once I had my hair cornrowed for the Matrix dance, I started getting attention from girls for the first time. I actually went on dates. At times, I thought that was because I looked better. At other times, I thought it was because girls liked the fact that I was going through as much pain as they did to look good. Either way, once I found success, I wasn't going to mess with the formula. I kept going back to the salon every week, spending hours at a time getting my hair straightened and cornrowed. My mom would just roll her eyes. I could never date a man who spends more time on his hair than I do she said. Monday through Saturday, my mom worked in her office and puttered around the garden like a homeless person. Then Sunday morning for church, she'd do her hair and put on a nice dress and some high heels, and she looked like a million bucks. Once she was all done up, she couldn't resist teasing me, throwing little verbal jabs the way we always do with each other. Now who's the best looking person in the family, eh? I hope you enjoyed your week of being the pretty one, because the queen is back, baby. You spent four hours at the salon to look like that. I just took a shower. She was just having fun with me. No son wants to talk about how hot his mom is. Because truth be told, she was beautiful. Beautiful on the outside, beautiful on the inside. She had a self-confidence that I never possessed. Even when she was working in the garden, dressed in overalls and covered in mud, you could see how attractive she was. I can only assume that my mother broke more than a few hearts in her day, but from the time I was born, there were only two men in her life, my father and my stepfather. Right around the corner from my father's house in Yeoville, there was a garage called Mighty Mechanics. Our Volkswagen was always breaking down, and my mom would take it there to get it repaired. We met this really cool guy there, Abel, one of the auto mechanics. I'd see him when we went to fetch the car. The car broke down a lot, so we were there a lot. Eventually, it felt like we were there even when there was nothing wrong with the vehicle. I was six, maybe seven. I didn't understand everything that was happening. I just knew that suddenly this guy was around. He was tall, lanky, and lean, but strong. He had these long arms and big hands. He could lift car engines and gearboxes. He was handsome, but he wasn't good looking. My mom liked that about him. She used to say, there's a type of ugly that women find attractive. She called him Abby. He called her Mboisi. Mboi, short for Nambaisio. Abel wasn't trying to be my dad. My dad still was in my life, so I wasn't looking for anyone to replace him. That's mom's cool friend, is how I thought of Abel. He started coming out to stay with us in Eden Park. Some nights he'd want us to crash with him at his converted garage flat in Orange Grove, which we did. 
Then I burned down the white people's house, and that was the end of that. From then on, we lived together in Eden Park. One night, my mom and I were at a prayer meeting, and she took me aside. Hey, she said, I want to tell you something. Abel and I are going to get married. Instinctively, without even thinking, I said, I don't think that's a good idea. I wasn't upset or anything. I just had a sense about the guy, an intuition. I'd felt it even before the mulberry tree. That night hadn't changed my feelings towards Abel. It had only shown me, in flesh and blood, what he was capable of. I understand that it's hard, she said. I understand that you don't want a new dad. No, I said. It's not like that. I like Abel. I like him a lot. But you shouldn't marry him. There's just something not right about him. I don't trust him. I don't think he's a good person. I'd always been fine with my mom dating this guy, but I never considered the possibility of him becoming permanent addition to our family. I enjoyed being with Abel the same way I enjoyed playing with a tiger cub the first time I went to the tiger sanctuary. I liked it. I had fun with it, but I never thought about bringing it home. If there was any doubt about Abel, the truth was right there in front of us all along. His name. He was Abel, the good brother, the good son, a name straight out of the Bible, and he lived up the, he lived up to it as well. He was the firstborn, dutiful, took care of his mother, took care of his siblings. He was the pride of his family. But Abel was his English name. His song, tongue's name was Gisavini, which means be afraid. Mom and Abel got married. There was no ceremony, no exchange of rings. They went and signed papers, and that was it. A year or so later, my baby brother Andrew was born. I only vaguely remember my mom being gone for a few days. And when she got back, there was now this thing in the house that cried and pooped and got fed. But when you're nine years older than your sibling, their arrival doesn't change much for you. I wasn't changing diapers. I was out playing arcade games at the shop, running around the neighborhood. The main thing that marked Andrew's birth for me was our first trip to meet Abel's family during the Christmas holidays. They lived in Tanzanine, a town in Gazakulu, what had been the Tsonga homeland under apartheid. Tanzanine had a tropical climate, hot and humid. The white farms nearby grow some of the most amazing fruit, mangoes, lychees, the most beautiful bananas you've ever seen in your life. That's where all the fruit of South Africa exports to Europe comes from. But on the black land, 20 minutes down the road, the soil had been decimated by years of over-farming and over-grazing. Abel's mother and his sisters were all traditional, stay-at-home moms, and Abel and his younger brother, who was a policeman, supported the family. They were all very kind and generous and accepted us as a part of the family right away. Tongsa culture, I learned, is extremely, extremely patriarchal. We're talking about a world where women must bow when they greet a man. Men and women have limited social interactions. The men kill the animals and the women cook the food. Men are not even allowed in the kitchen. As a nine-year-old boy, I thought this was fantastic. I wasn't allowed to do anything. At home, my mom was forever making me do chores, wash the dishes, sweep the house. But when she tried to do that in Tanzania, the women wouldn't allow it. I was in heaven. My mother loathed every moment of being there. For Abel, a firstborn son, who was bringing home his own firstborn son, this trip was a huge deal. In the homelands, the firstborn son almost becomes the father, husband by default, because the dad is off working in the city. The firstborn son is the man of the house. He raises his siblings. His mom treats him with a certain level of respect as the dad's surrogate. Since this was Abel's big homecoming with Andrew, he expected my mother to play her traditional role too, but she refused. The two of them fought and bickered the whole time, and after that first trip, my mother refused to go back. Up to that point, I'd lived my whole life in a world run by women, but after my mom and Abel were married, and especially after Andrew was born, I watched him try to assert himself and impose his ideas of what he thought his family should be. One thing that became clear early on was that those ideas did not include me. I was a reminder that my mom had lived a life before him. I didn't even share his color. His family was him, my mom, and the new baby. My family was my mom and me. 
I actually appreciated that about Abel. Sometimes he was my buddy, sometimes not. But he never pretended our relationship was anything other than what it was. We'd joke around and laugh together. We'd watch TV together. He'd slip me pocket money now and again after my mother said I'd had enough. But he never gave me a birthday or Christmas present. He never gave me the affection of a father. I was never his son. Abel's presence in the house brought with it new roles. One of the first things he did was kick Foofy and Panther outdoors. No dogs in the house. But we've always had dogs in the house. Not anymore. In an African home, dogs sleep outside. People sleep inside. Putting the dogs in the yard was Abel's way of reigning in our independence. He even got upset about church. You cannot be at church the whole day, he'd say. What will people say? No, no, no. This brings disrespect to me. One of the most effective tools he'd used to prevent my mother from spending so much time at church was to stop fixing her car. It would break down, and he'd purposely let it sit. My mom couldn't afford another car, and she couldn't get the car fixed somewhere else. You're married to a mechanic, and you're going to get your car fixed by another mechanic? That's worse than cheating. So Abel became our only transport, and he would refuse to take us places. Ever defiant, my mother would take the minibuses to get to church. Losing the car also meant losing access to my dad. We had to ask Abel for rides to Yeoville, and he didn't like what we were, what they were for. It was an insult to his manhood. So I saw my father less and less. Not long after, my dad moved down to Cape Town. Abel wanted a traditional marriage with a traditional wife. For a long time, I wondered why he'd ever married a woman like my mom in the first place, as she was the opposite of that in every way. If he wanted a woman to bow to him, there were plenty of girls back in Tanzania being raised solely for that purpose. The way my mother always explained it, the traditional man wants a woman to be subservient. But he never falls in love with subservient women. He's attracted to independent women. He's like an exotic bird collector, she said. He only wants a woman who is free because his dream is to put her in a cage. When we first met Abel, he smoked a lot of weed. He drank too, but it was mostly weed, which mellowed him out. He'd smoke, chill, watch TV, and fall asleep. I think subconsciously, it was something he knew he needed to do to take the edge off his anger. He stopped smoking after he and my mom got married. She made him stop for religious reasons, the body's a temple, and so on. But what none of us saw coming was that when he stopped smoking weed, he just replaced it with alcohol. He started drinking more and more. He never came home from work sober. An average day was a six-pack of beer after work. Weeknights, he'd have a buzz on. Some Fridays and Saturdays, he just didn't come home. When Abel drank, his eyes would go red, bloodshot. That was a clue I learned to read. I always thought of Abel as a cobra, calm, perfectly still, and explosive. There was no ranting and raving, no clenched fist. He'd be very quiet. Then out of nowhere, the violence would come. The eyes were my only clue to stay away. His eyes were everything. They were the eyes of the devil. Late one night, we woke up to a house filled with smoke. Abel hadn't come home by the time we'd gone to bed, and I'd fallen asleep in my mother's room with her and Andrew, who was still a baby. I jerked awake with her shaking me and screaming, Trevor! Trevor! There's smoke everywhere! We thought the house was burning down. My mom ran down the hallway to the kitchen, where she discovered the kitchen on fire. Abel had driven home drunk, blind drunk, drunker than we'd ever seen him before. He'd been hungry tried to heat up some food on the stove and passed out on the couch while it was cooking. The pot had burned itself out and burned up the kitchen wall behind the stove. The smoke was billowing everywhere. My mom turned off the stove, opened the doors and the windows to try and air the place out. Then she went over to the couch and woke Abel up and started berating him for nearly burning the house down. He was too drunk to care. She came back in the bedroom, picked up the phone, and called my grandmother. She started going on and on about Abel and his drinking. This man, he's going to kill us one day. He almost burnt the house down. Abel walked into the bedroom, very calm, very quiet. His eyes were blood red, his eyelids heavy. He put his finger on the cradle and hung up the call. My mom lost it. How dare you? Don't you hang up my phone call? What do you think you're doing? You don't tell people.
people what's happening in this house, he said. Oh, please, you're worried about what the world is thinking? Worry about this world. Worry about what your family is thinking. Abel towered over my mother. He didn't raise his voice, didn't get angry. Umboyi, he said softly. You don't disrespect me. Respect? You almost burned down our house. Respect? Oh, please, earn your respect. You want me to respect you as a man? Then act like a man. Umboyi, shut up. You're not a man. You're a child. Out of nowhere, like a clap of thunder, when there were no clouds, crack. He smacked her across the face. She ricocheted off the wall and collapsed like a ton of bricks. I'd never seen anything like it. She went down and stayed down for a good 30 seconds. Andrew started screaming. I don't remember going to pick him up, but I clearly remember holding him at some point. My mom pulled herself up and struggled back to her feet. She'd clearly been knocked for a loop, but she was trying to act more with it than she was. I could see the disbelief on her face. This had never happened to her before in her life. She got right back in Abel's face and started shouting at him. Did you just hit me? The whole time I kept thinking the same thing Abel had said. Shut up, Mom. Shut up. You're going to make it worse. Because I knew, as the receiver of many beatings, the one thing that doesn't help is talking back. But she wouldn't stay quiet. Crack. He hit her again. She stumbled back, but this time didn't fall. She scrambled, grabbed me, and grabbed Andrew. Let's go. We're leaving. We ran out of the house and up the road. It was the dead of night and cold outside. I was wearing nothing but a t-shirt and sweatpants. We walked to Eden Park Police Station, over a kilometer away. My mom marched us in, and there were two cops on duty at the front desk. I'm here to lay a charge, she said. What are you here to lay a charge about? I'm here to lay a charge against the man who hit me. To this day, I will never forget the patronizing, condescending way they spoke to her. Calm down, lady. Calm down. Who hit you? My husband. Your husband? What did you do? Did you make him angry? Did I? What? No, he hit me. I'm here to lay a charge against. You sure you want to do this? Go home and talk to your husband. Once you lay charges, you can't take them back. He'll have a criminal record. His life will never be the same. Do you really want your husband going to jail? My mom kept insisting that they take a statement and open a case, and they actually refused. They refused to write up a charge sheet. This is a family thing, they said. You don't want to involve the police. Maybe you want to think it over and come back in the morning. My mom started yelling at them, demanding to see the station commander. And right then, Abel walked into the station. He'd driven down. He'd sobered up a bit, but he was still drunk, driving up to a police station. That didn't matter. He walked over to the cops, and the station turned into a boys' club like they were a bunch of old pals. Hey guys, he said. You know how it is. You know how women can be. I just got a little angry. That's all. It's okay, man. We know it happens. Don't worry. I had never seen anything like it. I was nine years old, and I still thought of the police as the good guys. You get in trouble, you call the police, and those flashing red and blue lights are going to come and save you. But I remember standing there, watching my mom, flabbergasted horrified that these cops wouldn't help her. That's when I realized the police were not who I thought they were. They were men first and police second. We left the station. My mom took me and Andrew and we went to stay with my grandmother in Soweto for a while. A few weeks later, Abel drove over and apologized. Abel was always sincere and heartfelt with his apologies. He hadn't meant to do it. He knew he was wrong. He'd never do it again. My grandmother convinced my mom that she should give Abel a second chance. So we drove back to Eden Park together, and for years, nothing. For years, Abel didn't lay a finger on her. Everything went back to the way it had been. Abel was an amazing mechanic, probably one of the best around at the time. He'd been to technical college, graduated first in his class. He had job offers from BMW and Mercedes. His business thrived on referrals. People would bring their cars from all over the city for him to fix because he could work miracles on them. My mom truly believed in him. She thought he, she could raise him up. 
help him make good on his potential, not merely as a mechanic, but as the owner of his own workshop. As headstrong and independent as my mom is, she remains the woman who gives back. She gives and gives and gives. That is her nature. She refused to be subservient to Abel at home, but she did want him to succeed as a man. If she could make their marriage a true marriage of equals, she was willing to pour herself into it completely, the same way she poured herself into her children. At some point, Abel's boss decided to sell Mighty Mechanics and retire. My mom had some money saved, and she helped Abel buy it. They moved the workshop from Yeovil to the industrial area of Weinberg, just west of Alex, and the Mighty Mechanics became the new family business. When you first go into business, there are so many things nobody tells you. That's especially true when you're two young black people, a secretary and a mechanic, coming out of a time when blacks had never been allowed to own businesses. One of the things nobody tells you is that when you buy a business, you buy its debt. After my mom and Abel opened up the books on Mighty Mechanics and came to a full realization of what they bought, they saw how much trouble the company was already in. The garage gradually took over our lives. I'd get out of school and walk the five kilometers from Maryville to the workshop. I'd sit for hours and try to do my homework with the machines and repairs going on around me. Inevitably, Abel would get behind schedule on a car, and since he was our ride, we'd have to wait for him to finish before we could go home. We started out as, we're running late, go nap in a car, and we'll tell you when we're leaving. I'd crawl in the back seat of some sedan, and they'd wake me up at midnight, and we'd drive all the way back out to Eden Park and crash. Then pretty soon it was, we're running late, go sleep in a car, and we'll wake you for school in the morning. We'd start sleeping at the garage. At first it was one or two nights a week, then three or four. Then my mom sold the house and put that money into the business as well. She was all in. She gave up everything for Abel. From that point on, we lived in the garage. It was a cold, empty space. Gray concrete floors stained with oil and grease. Old junk cars and car parts everywhere. Near the front, next to the roller door that opened onto the street, there was a tiny office built out of drywall for doing paperwork. In the back was a kitchenette, a sink, a portable hot plate, and some cabinets. To bathe, there was only an open wash, wash basin, like a janitor's sink, with a shower head rigged up above. Abel and my mom slept with Andrew in the office on a thin mattress they'd roll out on the floor. I slept in the cars. I got really good at sleeping in cars. I knew all the best cars to sleep in. The worst were the cheap ones. Volkswagens, low-end Japanese sedans, the seats barely reclined no headrests, cheap fake leather upholstery. I'd spend half the night trying not to slide off the seat. I'd wake up with sore knees because I couldn't stretch out to extend my legs. German cars were wonderful, especially Mercedes. Big plush leather seats like couches. They were cold when you first climbed in, but they were well insulated and warmed up nicely. All I needed was my school blazer to curl up under, and I could get really cozy inside a Mercedes. The best, hands down, were American cars. I used to pray for a customer to come in with a big Buick with bench seats. If I saw one of those, I'd be like, yes. Since Mighty Mechanics was now a family business, and I was family, I also had to work. There was no more time for play. There wasn't even time for homework. I'd walk home, the school uniform would come off, the overalls would go on, and I'd get under the hood of some sedan. I got to the point where I could do basic service on a car by myself, and often I did. Abel would say, that Honda, minor service, and I'd get under, the get under the hood, day in, day out, points, plugs, condensers, oil filters, air filters, install new seats, change tires, swap headlights, fix taillights, go to the parts shop, buy the parts, back to the workshop, 11 years old, and that was my life. I was falling behind in school. We worked and worked and worked, but no matter how many hours we put in, the business kept losing money. We lost everything. We couldn't even afford real food. There was one month I'll never forget, the worst month of my life. We were so broke that for weeks we ate nothing but bowls of morogo, 
kind of wild spinach cooked with caterpillars, mopain worms they're called. Mopain worms are literally the cheapest thing that only the poorest of poor people eat. I grew up poor, but there's poor and then there's, wait, I'm eating worms? Mopain worms are the sort of thing where even people in Soweto were like, eh, no. They're these shiny, spiny, brightly colored caterpillars the size of your finger. They have these black spines that prick the roof of your mouth. And when you bite into one, it's not uncommon for its yellow-green excrement to squirt into your mouth. For a while, I sort of enjoyed the caterpillars. It was like a food adventure. But then over the course of weeks, eating them day after day, I couldn't take it anymore. I wanted to throw up. I snapped and ran to my mom crying. I don't want to eat caterpillars anymore. That night, she scraped some money together and bought us chicken. As poor as we'd been in the past, we'd never been without food. That was the period in my life I hated the most. Work all night, sleep in some car, wake up, wash up in a janitor's sink, brush my teeth in a little metal basin, brush my hair in the rear view mirror of a Toyota, then try, not, then try to get dressed without getting oil and grease all over my school clothes so the kids at school won't know I live in a garage. Oh, I hated it so much. I hated cars. I hated sleeping in cars. I hated working on cars. I hated getting my hands dirty. I hated eating worms. I hated it all. I didn't hate my mom, or even Abel, funnily enough, because I saw how hard everyone was working, but eventually I started to see why the business was hemorrhaging money. I used to go around and buy auto parts for Abel, and I learned that he was buying his parts on credit. The vendors were charging him a crazy markup. The debt was crippling the company, and instead of paying off the debt, he was drinking what little cash he had made. Brilliant mechanic, horrible businessman. At a certain point, to try and save the garage, my mother quit her job at ICI and stepped in to help Abel run the workshop. She brought her office skills to the garage full time and started keeping the books, making the schedule, balancing the accounts, and it was going well until Abel started to feel like she was running his business. People started commenting on it as well. Clients were getting their cars on time. Vendors were getting paid on time. And they would say, hey, Abe, this workshop is going so much better now that your wife has taken over. That didn't help. We lived in the workshop for close to a year, and then my mom had had, had enough. She was willing to help Abel but not if he was going to drink all the profits. She had always been independent, self-sufficient, but she lost the part of her herself at the mercy of someone else's failed dream. At a certain point, she said, I can't do this anymore. I'm out of this. I'm done. She went out and got a job as a secretary with a real estate developer. And somehow, between that and borrowing against whatever equity was left in Abel's shop, she was able to get us a house in Highlands North. We moved, the workshop was seized by Abel's creditors, and that was the end of that. Growing up, I suffered no shortage of my mother's old school, Old Testament discipline. She spared no rod and spoiled no child. With Andrew, she was different. He got spankings at first, but they tapered off and eventually stopped. When I asked her why I got beatings and Andrew didn't, she made a joke about it like she did with everything. I beat you like that because you could take it, she said. I can't hit your little brother the same way because he's a skinny little stick. He'll break, but you, God gave you that bottom for a whipping. Even though she was kidding, I could tell that the reason she didn't beat Andrew was because she had a genuine change of heart on the matter. It was a lesson she'd learned, oddly enough, from me. I grew up in a world of violence, but I myself was never violent. Yes, I played pranks and set fires and broke windows, but I never attacked people. I never hit anyone. I was never angry. I just didn't see myself that way. My mother had exposed me to a different world than the one she grew up in. She bought me the books that she never got to read. She took me to the schools that she never got to go to. I immersed myself in those worlds and came back looking at the world in a different way. I saw that not all farmers are violent. I saw that the, few, the 
the futility of violence, the cycle that just repeats itself, the damage that's inflicted on people that they in turn inflict on others. I saw more than anything that relationships are not sustained by violence, but by love. Love is a creative act. When you love someone, you create a new world for them. My mother did that for me. With the progress I made and the things I learned, I came back and created a new world and a new understanding for her. After that, she never raised her hand to her children again. Unfortunately, by the time she stopped, Abel had started. I was in grade six, my last year at Maryville. We moved to Highlands North, and I'd gotten in trouble at school for forging my mom's signature on some document. There was some activity I didn't want to participate in, so I signed the release with her name to get out of it. The school called my mom, and she asked me about it when I got home that afternoon. I was certain she was going to punish me, but this turned out to be one of those times when she didn't care. She said I should have just asked her. She would have signed the form anyway. Then Abel, who had been sitting in the kitchen with us, watching the whole thing, said, Hey, can I talk to you for a second? Then he took me into this tiny room, a walk-in pantry off the kitchen, and he closed the door behind us. He was standing between me and the door, but I didn't think anything of it. It didn't occur to me to be scared. Abel had never tried to discipline me before. He'd never even given me a lecture. It was always, um, boy, your son did this, and then my mother would handle it. And this was the middle of the afternoon. He was completely sober, which made what happened next all the more terrifying. The first blow hit me in the ribs. I never learned how to fight, but I had this instinct that told me to get in close. I'd seen what those long, long arms could do. I'd seen him take down my mom, but more important, I'd seen him take down grown men. Abel never hit people with the punch. I never saw him punch another person with a closed fist, but he had this ability to hit a grown man across his face with an open hand and they'd crumple. He was that strong. I looked at his arms and I knew, don't be on the other end of those things. I ducked in close and he kept hitting and hitting, but I was in too tight for him to land any solid blows. Then he caught on and he stopped hitting and he started trying to grapple and wrestle me. He grabbed the skin on my arms and pinched it between his thumb and forefinger and twisted hard. That hurt. I'd never been that scared before, ever, because there was no purpose to it. That's what made it so terrifying. It wasn't discipline. Nothing about it was coming from a place of love. It didn't feel like someone, something that would end with me learning a lesson about forging my mom's signature. It felt like something that would end when he wanted it to end, when his rage was spent. I felt like there was something inside him that wanted to destroy me. Abel was much bigger and stronger than me, but being in a confined space was to my advantage because he didn't have room to maneuver. As he was grappling and punched, I somehow managed to twist and wriggle my way around him and slip out the door. I was quick, but Abel was quick as well. He chased me. I ran out of the house and jumped over the gate. And I ran and I ran and I ran. The last time I turned around, he was rounding the gate, coming out of the yard after me. Until I turned 25 years old, I had a reoccurring nightmare of the look on his face as he came around that corner. I ran like the devil was chasing me. Abel was bigger and faster, but this was my neighborhood. You couldn't catch me in my neighborhood. I knew every alley and every street and every wall to climb over and every fence to slip through. I was ducking through traffic, cutting through yards. I have no idea when he gave up because I never looked back. I ran and ran and ran as far as my legs would carry me. But I was in Bramley, three neighbors, neighborhoods away when I stopped. I found the hiding place in some bushes, I crawled inside and huddled there for what felt like hours. You don't have to teach me a lesson twice. From that day until the day I left home, I lived like a mouse in that house. If Abel was in a room, I was out of the room. If he was in one corner, I was in the other corner. If he walked into a room, I would get up and act like I was going to the kitchen. When I re-entered the room, I would make sure I was close to the door. He could be in the happiest, friendliest mood. Didn't matter. Never again did I let him come between me and a door. Maybe a couple of times after that I was sloppy and he'd land a punch or a kick before I could get away. But 
I never trusted him again, not for a moment. When Mighty Mechanics went under, Abel had to get his cars out. Someone was taking over the property. There were liens against his assets. It was a mess. That's when he started running his workshop out of our yard. It's also when my mother divorced him. In African culture, there's legal marriage and traditional marriage. Just because you divorce someone legally doesn't mean they are no longer your spouse. Once Abel's debts and his terrible business decisions started affecting my mother's credit and her ability to support her sons, she wanted out. I don't have debts, she said. I don't have bad credit. I'm not doing these things with you. We were still a family and they were still traditionally married, but she divorced him to separate their financial affairs. She also took her name back. Because Abel started running an unlicensed business in a residential area, one of the neighbors filed a petition to get rid of us. My mom applied for a license to be able to operate a business on the property. The workshop stayed, but Abel kept running it into the ground, drinking his money. At the same time, my mother started moving up the real estate company she worked for and taking on more responsibilities and earning a better salary. Abel's workshop became like a side hobby almost. He was supposed to pay for Andrew's school fees and groceries, but he started falling behind on that, and soon my mom was paying for everything. She paid the electricity. She paid the mortgage. He literally contributed nothing. That was the turning point. When my mother started making more money and getting her independence back, that's when we saw the dragon emerge. The drinking got worse. He grew more and more violent. It wasn't long after coming for me in the pantry that Abel hit my mom for the second time. I can't recall the details of it because now it's muddled with all the other times that came after it. I do remember that the police were called. They came out to the house this time, but again, but again it was like a boys club. No report was made. No charges were filed. Whenever he hit her or come after me, my mom would find me crying afterward and take me aside. She'd give me the same talk every time. Pray for Abel, she said, because he doesn't hate us. He hates himself. To a kid, this makes no sense. Well, if he hates himself, I'd say, why doesn't he kick himself? Abel kicks, kicked the dogs, too. Foofy, mostly. Panther was smart enough to stay away, but dumb, lovable Foofy was forever trying to be Abel's friend. She'd cross his path or be in his way when he had a few, and he'd give her the boot. After that, she'd go and hide somewhere for a while. Foofy getting kicked was always the warning sign that stuff was about to go down. The dogs and the workers in the yard often got the first taste of his anger, and that would let the rest of us know to lie low. I'd usually go find Foofy wherever she was hiding and be with her. The strange thing was that when Foofy got kicked, she never yelped or cried. When the vet diagnosed her as deaf, he also found out that she had some condition where she didn't have a fully developed sense of touch. She didn't feel pain, which was why she would always start over with Abel like it was a new day. He'd kick her, she'd hide, then she'd be right back the next morning, wagging her tail. Hey, I'm here. I'll give you another chance. And he always got the second chance. The Abel who was likable and charming never went away. He had a drinking problem, but he was a nice guy. We had a family. Growing up in a home of abuse, you struggle with the notion that you can love a person you hate or hate a person you love. It's a strange feeling. You want to live in a world where someone is good or bad, where you either hate them or love them, but that's not how people are. There was an undercurrent of terror that ran through the house, but the actual beatings themselves were not that frequent. And I think if they had been, the situation would have ended sooner. Ironically, the good times in between were what allowed it to drag out and escalate as far as it did. He hit my mom once. Then the next time was three years later. And it was just a little bit worse. Then it was two years later. It was just a little bit worse. Then it was a year later. And it was just a little bit worse. It was sporadic enough that you would think it wouldn't happen again. But it was frequent enough that you never forgot it was possible. One afternoon, I came home from Sandringham, and my mom was very upset and worked up. This man is unbelievable, she said. What happened? He bought a gun. What? A gun? What 
do you mean? He bought a gun. My mom said she'd confronted Abel about it. He had gone off on some nonsense about the world needing to learn to respect him. He thinks he's the policeman of the world, she said, and that's the problem with the world. We have people who cannot police themselves, so they want to police everyone else around them. Not long after that, I moved out. The atmosphere had become toxic, toxic for me. I was also It was also just time for me to go. Regardless of Abel, our plan had always been for me to move out after school. My mother never wanted me to be like my uncle, one of those men unemployed and still living at home with his mother. She'd helped me get my flat, and I moved out. The flat was only 10 minutes away from the house, so it was always around to drop in to help with errands or have dinner once in a while. But most important, whatever was going on with Abel, I didn't have to be involved. At some point, my mom moved into a separate bedroom in the house, and from then on, they were married in name only, not even cohabitating, but coexisting. The state of affairs lasted a year or two. Andrew had turned nine. And in my world, I was counting down until he turned 18, thinking, thinking that he would finally free my mom from this abusive man. Then one afternoon, my mom called and asked me to come by the house. A few hours later, I popped by. Trevor, she said, I'm pregnant. Sorry, what? I'm pregnant. What? Good Lord, I was furious. I was so angry. She herself seemed resolute, as determined as ever but with an undertone of sadness I'd never seen before, like the news had devastated her at first, but she'd since reconciled herself to the reality of it. How could you let this happen? Abel and I, we made up and moved back into the bedroom. So you're going to stay with this man another 18 years? Are you crazy? God spoke to me, Trevor. He told me, Patricia, I don't do anything by mistake. There is nothing I give you that you cannot handle. I'm pregnant for a reason. I know what kind of kids I can make. I know what kind of sons I can raise. I can raise this child. I will raise this child. Nine months later, Isaac was born. She called him Isaac because in the Bible, Sarah gets pregnant when she's like a hundred years old and she's not supposed to be having children. And that's what she names her son. My mom was 44. Isaac's birth pushed me even further away. I visited less and less. Then I popped by one afternoon, and the house was in chaos. Police cars out front, the aftermath of another fight. He'd hit her with a bicycle. Abel had been berating one of his workers in the yard. My mom had tried to get between them. Abel was furious that she contradicted him in front of an employee, so he picked up Andrew's bike, and he beat her with it. Again, she called the police, and the cops, who showed up this time, actually knew Abel. He'd fixed their cars. They were pals. No charges were filed. Nothing happened. That time I confronted him. I was big enough now. You can't keep doing this, I said. This is not right. I know, he said. But you know how your mom is. She came and disrespected me in front of my co-workers. I can't have these other men looking at me like I don't know how to control my wife. After the bicycle, my mom hired contractors she knew through the real estate business to build her a separate house in the backyard, like a little servant's quarters, and she moved in there with Isaac. This was the most insane thing I've ever seen, I told her. This is all I can do, she said. The police won't help me. The government won't protect me. Only my God can protect me. But what can I do? But what I can do is use him against the one thing he cherishes, and that is his pride. By me living outside in the shack, everyone will know that something is wrong with him. He's a saint in the streets. He's a devil in this house. Let him be seen for who he is. When my mom had decided to keep Isaac, I was so close to writing her off. I couldn't stand the pain anymore. But seeing her hit with a bicycle, living like a prisoner in her own backyard, was the final straw for me. I was done. My mom understood. She didn't feel betrayed or abandoned. Honey... I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going through, she said. At one point, I had to disown my family to go off and live my own life, too. I understand why you need to do this, why you need to do the same. So I did. I walked out. I didn't call. I didn't visit. Isaac came, and I went. And for the life of me, 
I could not understand why she wouldn't do the same. Leave. Just leave. Eventually she did leave. What prompted her to leave, what the final breaking point was, I have no idea. I was gone. I was off becoming a comedian, touring the country, playing shows in England, hosting radio shows, hosting television shows, and moved in with my cousin, Malung GC. Made my life separate from hers. I couldn't invest myself anymore because it would have broken me into too many pieces. But one day, she bought another house in Highlands North, met someone new, and moved on with her life. Andrew and Isaac still saw their dad, who by that point was just existing in the world, still going through the same cycle of drinking and fighting, still living in a house paid for by his ex-wife. Years passed. Life carried on. Then one morning I was in bed. Around 10 a.m., my phone rang. It was a Sunday. I know it was on a Sunday because everyone else in the family had gone to church. And I quite happily had not. The days of endlessly schlepping back and forth to church were no longer my problem. I was lazily sleeping in. I looked over at my phone. It was flashing my mom's number. But when I answered, it was Andrew on the other end. He sounded perfectly calm. Hey, Trevor. It's Andrew. Hey, how are you? Good. What's up? Are you busy? I'm sort of sleeping. Why? Mom's been shot. Okay, so there are two strange things about that call. First, why would he ask me if I was busy? Let's start there. When your mom's been shot, the first thing, first line out of your mouth should be, Mom's been shot. Not how are you? Not are you busy? That confused me. The second weird thing was when he said, Mom's been shot. I didn't ask who shot her. I didn't have to. Where are you now? I said. We're at Linksfield Hospital. Okay, I'm on my way. I jumped out of bed, ran down the corridor, and banged Malung GC's door. Dude, my mom's been shot. She's in the hospital. He jumped out of bed too, and we got in the car and raced to the hospital, which luckily was only 15 minutes away. At that point, I was upset, but not terrified. Andrew had been so calm on the phone. I was thinking, she must be okay. It must not be that bad. I called him back from the car to find out more. Andrew, what happened? We were on our way home from church, he said, again totally calm, and Dad was waiting for us at the house, and he got out of his car, and he started shooting. But where? Where did he shoot her? He shot her in her leg. Oh, okay, I said relieved, and then he shot her in the head. When he said that, my body just let go. I remember the exact traffic light I was at. For a moment, there was a complete vacuum of sound, and then I cried tears like I never cried before. I collapsed in heaving sobs and moans. It was an expression of raw pain. She was my mom. She was my teammate. And it had always been me and her together. Me and her against the world. I broke in two. The light changed. I couldn't even see the road. But I drove through the tears thinking, just get there, just get there, just get there. We pulled up to the hospital and I jumped out of the car. There was an outdoor sitting area by the entrance to the emergency room. Andrew was standing there, waiting for me alone, his clothes smeared with blood. He looked perfectly calm, completely stoic. Then the moment he looked up and saw me, he broke down and started bawling. It was like he had been holding it together the whole morning, and then everything broke loose at once and he lost it. I ran to him and hugged him, and he cried and cried. His cry was different from mine, though. My cry was one of pain and anger. His cry was of helplessness. I turned and ran into the emergency room. My mom was there in triage on the gurney. The doctors were stabilizing her. Her whole body was soaked in blood. There was a hole in her face, a gaping wound above her lip, part of her nose gone. She was as calm and serene as I'd ever seen her. She could still open one eye, and she turned and looked up at me and saw the look of horror on my face. It's okay, baby. She whispered, barely able to speak with the blood in her throat. It's not okay. No, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. Where's Andrew? Where's your brother? He's outside. Go to Andrew. But Mom! Shh, it's okay, baby, I'm fine. You're not fine, you're... Shh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Go to your brother. Your brother needs you. The doctors kept working and there was nothing I could do to help her. 
I went, went back outside to be with Andrew. We sat down and he told me the story. They were coming home from church, a big group. My mom, Andrew, Isaac, her new husband and his children, and the whole bunch of his extended family. They had just been pulled into the driveway when Abel pulled up and got out of his car. He had his gun. He looked right at my mother. You've stolen my life, he said. You've taken everything away from me. Now I'm going to kill all of you. Andrew stepped in front of his father. He stepped right in front of the gun. Don't do this, Dad. Please, you're drunk. Just put the gun away. Abel looked down at his son. No, he said. I'm killing everybody, and if you don't walk away, I will shoot you first. Andrew stepped aside. His eyes were not lying, he told me. He had the eyes of the devil. In that moment, I could tell my father was gone. For all the pain I felt this, that day, in hindsight, I've, I have to imagine that the Andrew's pain was far greater than mine. My mom had been shot by a man I despised. If anything, I felt vindicated. I'd been right about Abel all along. I could direct my anger and hatred toward him with no shame or guilt whatsoever. But Andrew's mother had been shot by Andrew's father, a father he loved. How does he reconcile his love with that situation? How does he carry on loving both sides, both sides of himself? Isaac was only four years old. He didn't fully comprehend what was happening, and Andrew stepped aside. And as Andrew stepped aside, Isaac started crying. Daddy, what are you doing? Daddy, what are you doing? Isaac, go to your brother, Abel said. Isaac ran over to Andrew, and Andrew held him. Then Abel raised his gun, and he started shooting. My mother jumped in front of the gun to protect everyone. And that's when she took the first bullet. Not in her leg, but in her butt cheek. She collapsed, and as she fell to the ground, she screamed, Run! Abel kept shooting, and everyone ran. They scattered. My mom was struggling to get back to her feet when Abel walked up and stood over her. He pointed the gun at her head point blank, execution style. Then he pulled the trigger. Nothing. The gun fired. The gun misfired. Click. He pulled the trigger again. Same thing. Then again and again. Click, 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 click. Four times he pulled the trigger and four times the gun misfired. Bullets were popping out of the ejection port, falling out of the gun, falling down on my mom and clattering to the ground. Abel stopped to see what was wrong with the gun. My mother jumped up in a panic. She shoved him aside, ran for the car, jumped into the driver's seat. Andrew ran behind and jumped into the passenger seat next to her. And just as she turned the ignition, Andrew heard one last gunshot, and the windshield went red. Abel had fired from behind the car. The bullet went into the back of her head and exited through the front of her face, and blood sprayed everywhere. Her body slumped over the steering wheel. Andrew reacted without thinking. He pulled my mom to the passenger side, flipped her over, jumped into the driver's seat, slammed the car into gear, and raced to the hospital in Linksfield. I asked Andrew what happened to Abel. He didn't know. I was filled with rage, but there was nothing I could do. I felt completely impotent, but I had to do something, so I took out my phone and I called him. I called the man who just shot my mom, and he actually picked up. Trevor, you killed my mom. Yes, I did. You killed my mom. Yes. Never. If I could find you, it would kill you as well. Then he hung up. It was chilling. It was terrifying. I don't know what I expected to happen. I was just enraged. I kept asking Andrew questions, trying to get more details. Then as we were talking, a nurse came outside looking for me. Are you the family? She asked. Yes. Sir? There's a problem. Your mother was speaking a bit at first. She stopped now, but from what we gathered, she doesn't have health insurance. What? That can't be true. I know my mom has health insurance. She didn't. As it turns out, a few months prior, she decided, the health insurance is a scam. I never get sick. I'm going to cancel it. So now, she had no health insurance. We can't treat your mother here, the nurse said. If she doesn't have insurance, we have to send her to a state hospital. State hospital? 
What? No, you can't. My mom's been shot in the head. You're going to put her back on a gurney? Send her out in an ambulance? She'll die. You need to treat her right now. Sir, we can't. We need a form of payment. I'm your form of payment. I'll pay. Yes, people say that, but without a guarantee, I pulled out my credit card. Here, I said, take this. I'll pay. I'll pay for everything. Sir, hospital can be very expensive. I don't care. Sir, I don't think you understand. Hospital can be really expensive. Lady, I have money. I'll pay anything. Just help us. Sir, you don't understand. We have to do so many tests. One test could cost two, three thousand rand. Three thousand what? Lady, this is my mother's life we're talking about. I'll pay. Sir, you don't understand. Your mother's been shot in your brain. She'll be in ICU. One night in ICU could cost you fifteen, twenty thousand rand. Lady, are you not listening to me? This is my mother's life. This is her life. Take the money. Take all of it. I don't care. Sir, you do not understand. I've seen this happen. Your mother could be in ICU for weeks. This could cost you 500,000, 600,000, maybe even millions. You'll be in debt the rest of your life. I'm not going to lie to you. I paused. I paused hard. What I heard the nurse saying was, all of your money will be gone. And then I started to think, well, what is she, 50? That's pretty good, right? She's lived a good life. I genuinely did not know what to do. I stared at the nurse as the shock of what she'd said sunk in. My mind raced through a dozen different scenarios. What if I spend that money and then she dies anyway? Do I get a refund? I actually imagined my mother, as frugal as she was, waking up from a coma and saying, You spent how much? You idiot! You should have saved that money to look after your brothers. And what about my brothers? There'd be my responsibility now. I would have to raise the family, which I couldn't do if I was millions in debt. And it was always my mother's solemn vow that raising my brothers was one thing I would never have to do. Even as my career took off, she refused any help I offered. I don't want you paying for your mother the same way I had to pay for mine, she'd say. I don't want you raising your brothers the same way Abel had to raise his. My mother's greatest fear was that I would end up paying the black tax, that I could get trapped in the cycle of poverty and violence that came before me. She had always promised me that I would be the one to break that cycle. I wouldn't be the one, I would be the one to move forward and not back. And as I looked at that nurse outside the emergency room, I was petrified that the moment I handed her my credit card, the cycle would just continue and I'd get sucked right back in. People say all the time that they'd really do anything for the people they love. But would you really? Would you do anything? Would you give everything? I don't know that a child knows that kind of selfless love. A mother, yes. A mother will clutch her, her children and jump from a moving car to keep them from harm. She will do it without thinking. But I don't think the ch child knows how to do that. Not instinctively. It's something the child has to learn. I pressed my credit card into the nurse's hand. Do whatever you have to do. Just please help my mom. We spent the rest of the day in limbo, waiting, not knowing, pacing around the hospital, family members stopping by. Several hours later, the doctor finally came out of the emergency room to give us an update. What's happening? I asked. Your mother is stable, he said. She's out of surgery. Is she going to be okay? He thought for a moment about what he was going to say. I don't like to use this word, he said, because I'm a man of science, and I don't believe in it. But what happened to your mother today was a miracle. I don't have any other way to explain this. The bullet that hit my mother in the butt, he said, was a through and through. It went in and came out and didn't do any real damage. The other bullet went in the back of her head, entering below the skull at the top of her neck. It missed the spinal cord by a hair, missed the medulla oblongata, and traveled through her head just underneath the brain, missing every major vein, artery, and nerve. With the traje trajectory that the bullet was on, it was headed straight for her left eye socket and would have blown out her eye, but instead, at the last second, slowed down 
hit her cheekbone instead, shattered her cheekbone, ricocheted off, and came out through her left nostril. On the gurney in the emergency room, the blood had made the wound look much worse than it was. The bullet took off only a tiny flap of skin on the side of her nostril, and it came out clean, with no bullet fragments left inside. She didn't even need surgery. They stopped the bleeding, stitched her up in the back, stitched her up in the front, and let her heal. There was nothing we could do, because there was nothing we needed to do, the doctor said. My mother was out of the hospital in four days. She was back at work in seven. The doctors kept her sedated the rest of that day and night to rest. They told us all to go home. She's stable, they said. Go home and sleep. So we did. I went back first thing in the morning, and when I walked into her room, she was still sleeping. The back of her head was bandaged. She had stitches in her face and the gauze covering her nose and left eye. She looked frail and weak and tired, one of the few times in my life I'd ever seen her look that way. I sat close by her bed, holding her hand, waiting and watching her breathe. A flood of thoughts going through my mind. I was still afraid I was going to lose her. I was angry at myself for not being there, angry at the police for all the times they didn't arrest Abel. I took myself, I told myself I should have killed him years ago which was ridiculous to think because I'm not capable of killing anyone, but I thought it anyway. I was angry at the world, angry at God, because all my mom does is pray. If there's a fan club for Jesus, my mom is definitely in the top 100, and this is what she gets? After an hour or so waiting, she opened her unbandaged eye. The second she did, I lost it. I started bawling. She asked for some water, and I gave her a cup. She leaned forward a bit to sip through the straw. I kept bawling and bawling and bawling. I couldn't control myself. Shh, she said. Don't cry, baby. Shh, don't cry. How can I not cry, Mom? You almost died. No, I wasn't going to die. I wasn't going to die. It's okay. I wasn't going to die. But I thought you were dead. I kept bawling and bawling. I thought I lost you. No, baby. Baby, don't cry. Trevor, Trevor, listen. Listen to me, listen. What? I said, tears streaming down my face. My child, you must look on the bright side. What? What are you talking about? The bright side. Mom, you were shot in the face. There is no bright side. Of course there is. Now you're officially the best looking person in the family. She broke out in a huge smile and started laughing. Through my tears, I started laughing too. I was bawling my eyes out and laughing hysterically at the same time. We sat there, she squeezed my hand, and we cracked each other up the way we always did. Mother and son, laughing together, through the pain in an intensive care recovery room on a bright and sunny and beautiful day. When my mother was shot, so much happened so quickly. We were only able to piece the whole story together after the fact as we collected all the different accounts from everyone who was there. Waiting around at the hospital that day, we had so many unanswered questions like, what happened to Isaac? Where was Isaac? We only found out after we located him, and he told us. When Andrew sped off with my mom, leaving the four-year-old alone on the front lawn, Abel walked over to his youngest, picked him up, and put the boy in his car and drove away. As they drove, Isaac turned to his dad. Dad, why did you kill mom? asked at that point assuming as we all did that my mom was dead because I'm very unhappy Abel replied because I'm very sad yeah but you shouldn't kill mom where are we going now I'm gonna go drop you off at your uncle's house and where are you going I'm going to kill myself but don't kill yourself dad no I'm going to kill myself the uncle Abel was talking about was not a real uncle, but a friend. He dropped Isaac off with his friend, and then he drove off. He spent that day visiting relatives and friends, saying his goodbyes. He even told people what he had done, and that he intended to kill himself. He spent the whole day on this strange farewell tour, until finally one of his cousins called him out. You need to man up, the cousin said. This is the coward's way. You need to turn yourself in. If you are man enough to do this, 
You have to be man enough to face the consequences. Abel broke down and handed his gun over to the cousin. The cousin drove him to the police station, and Abel turned himself in. He spent a couple weeks in jail, waiting for a bail hearing. He filed a motion opposing bail because he'd shown that he was a threat. Since Andrew and Isaac were still minors, social workers started getting involved. We felt like the case was open and shut. But then one day, after a month or so, we got a call that Abel had made bail. The great irony was that he got bail because he told the judge that if he was in jail, he couldn't earn money to support his kids. But he wasn't supporting his kids. My mom was supporting the kids. So Abel was out. The case slowly ground its way through the legal system, and everything went against us. Because of my mother's miraculous recovery, the charge was only attempted murder. Because no domestic violence charges had ever been filed in all the times my mother had called the police to report him, Abel had no criminal record. He got a good lawyer, who continued to lean on the court about the fact that he had children at home who needed him. The case never went to trial. Abel pled guilty to attempted murder. He was given three years probation. He didn't serve a single day in prison. He kept joint custody of his sons. He's walking around Johannesburg today, completely free. The last I heard, he still lives somewhere around Highlands North, not too far from my mom. The final piece of the story came from my mom, who could only tell us her side after she woke up. She remembered Abel pulling up and pointing the gun at Andrew. She remembered falling to the ground after getting shot in the butt. Then Abel came and stood over her and pointed the gun at her head. She looked up and at him straight down the barrel of the gun. Then she started to pray, and that's when the gun misfired. Then it misfired again, and it misfired again and again. She jumped up, shoved him away, and ran to the car. Andrew leapt in beside her. She turned the ignition, and then her memory went blank. To this day, nobody can explain what happened. Even the police didn't understand, because it wasn't like the gun didn't work. It fired, and then it didn't fire, and then it fired again for the final shot. Anyone who knows anything about firearms will tell you that a 9mm handgun cannot misfire in the way that that gun did. But at the crime scene, the police had drawn little chalk circles all over the driveway, all over the spent shell casings from the shots Abel had fired, and then these four bullets intact from when he was standing over my mom. Nobody knows why. My mom's total hospital bill came to 50,000 rand. I paid it the day we left. For four days, we'd been in the hospital, family members visiting, talking and hanging out, laughing and crying. As we packed up her things to leave, I was going on about how insane the whole week had been. You're lucky to be alive, I told her. I still can't believe you didn't have any health insurance. Oh, but I do have insurance, she said. You do? Yes. Jesus. Jesus? Jesus. Jesus is your health insurance? If God is with me, who can be against me? Okay, Mom. Trevor, I prayed. I told you I prayed. I don't pray for nothing. You know, I said, for once I cannot argue with you. The gun, the bullets, I can't explain any of it, so I'll give you that much. And then I couldn't resist teasing her with one last little jab. But where was your Jesus to pay your hospital bill? Hmm? I know for a fact he didn't pay that. She smiled and said, you're right, he didn't, but he blessed me with a son who did.